so we are here in the aws management console and uh, this is the instance that i have and uh, when i apply the public ip or the public dns i am able to get the information back so it's responding very nicely so currently what the aim that we have is we want to create our own load balancer and that's what we are going to do so on the left hand side pan uh, there you can see on the sidebar there you can see load balancers just you need to click on that and as you can see i don't have any load balance right now so this is basically region scope so it is telling like you don't have any load balancers in this region so what you're going to do is you want to create load balancer by clicking on this so as we have already discussed like there are three type of load balancers one is the application load balancer the next one is the network load balancer and the one that we are not going to use that is the classic load balancer that is the deprecated one that is the older generation one so for the exam point of view application load balancer is very important and uh, as network load balancers are for the extreme high performance applications we are going to create the application load balancer here so just what you need to do you are just going to click on create and here this is the basic configuration setting for the load balancer so first thing that we need want obviously is to provide it a name so i'll give it a name first load balancer and it should be internet facing so that we can use it from the internet or by accessing it from the browser and uh, the ip address type should be ipv4 because we are working on ipv4 and there's a dual stack as well where you can use dual stack if you're working with both the ipv4 and ipv6 for now we will be using ipv4 so we'll select this the load balancer protocol is obviously http that we are going to use and the port 80 that we are going to allow from there and i don't want to add any more listeners to this and availability zone uh, to make it available across the multiple availability zones we need to choose all the three of them because we want our applications to be highly available isn't it and i don't want to add any tags as of now i'll just keep it as it is and i'll move to configure security settings here it is telling that uh, we need to have a HTTPS protocol for the front-end connections, but I don't need to give it uh, a front-end uh, HTTPS protocol right now. So I'll just click on configure security groups. Here I can either select an existing one or I can create a new one. But what we are going to do is we are going to create a new security group for our load balancer. This will be fun. Just watch this. So you want to create a new security group. I'll tell it as uh, load balancer hyphen sg so this is my security group load balancer sg i'm going to copy this okay so the rules that i'm going to allow from this one is i'm going to delete this so the first rule that i'm going to allow is only http so this is port 80 and i'm going to remove this this is for the ipv6 okay so i'm going to allow 80 or the http one okay i'm just going to allow this for a moment okay so click on next so the next thing that is that uh, we have finally reached to a point where we are going to create the target groups. Okay, so now as we don't have any target groups already there, so we are going to create one. So there's the first, so the first target group is there. So the type of target that we want is the instance itself. So uh, we will keep it as instance, not the IP address. The protocol that we are going to use is based on the traffic routing that we have is HTTP. So keep it as HTTP and the port as 80. Now the health check, actually it is going to use the HTTP protocol, but we don't have any underlying paths as of now configured for our application. So it'll be just slash. So it'll just try to contact this, this particular URL itself. And uh, advanced health settings that we have here, uh, you can have a traffic port or a override where you can actually override this to use a particular port to basically check let's suppose you want to have a health check on a port number specific to your needs you can as well add it but for now we'll have it as for the traffic port that is going to be 80 so the healthy threshold means that it should check for five times the health check should be checking five times before it should term it as healthy and uh, unhealthy threshold is if it fails for two times then mark it as unhealthy and there is a default timeout of five seconds and the interval of basically doing a health check is 30 seconds is set to 30 seconds these are the by default values that we have so basically 200 is the success code that you want and if the api returns 200 then you mark it as 
a success and if it is successful for five times and we just mark it as healthy so the next thing that we want is to register the targets uh, so yes so now as we have uh, we have configured the load balancer but we have not but we have not told the load balancer to what it has to basically monitor or it has to basically redirect the traffic so we have to register the targets the targets will be registered to the target groups so i have already created the instance so this is going to be my target so i'll click on this and add to register so once you have added this to the registered list then it will be added to the target register or the target groups so you can click on this and as well remove it but we are not going to remove it as of now we are going to add it so that we can use it so next click on review and you can just review them for your own uh, confirmation and then just click on create it will just add everything that you need so it will take us a, a few minutes uh, for us to actually get the load balancer up and running so we can just wait for a few minutes before using it so i'll just go ahead and close this and the thing that you can see here right now is we have the first load balancer that we have the name of that and the dns name we already have it the state is under provisioning and the vpc id is already added it's under the three availability zones that we have and it is internet facing so it is public facing as well we can use it over the internet and the three availability zones that i already mentioned it is available here and it is using the specific uh, load balancer that we created and you can go to the listeners it is using http 80 as the listener id and the rules that we have is forwarding to first target group so this is the target group that we had created and we had registered one of the instances that we had already running this is probably one of all the information that you need to know like you have the name of the target group the protocol it is supporting the port it is allowed access for the target type is instance and the targets are basically the instance that I added that the my instance one which, which is available over the AP South 1A availability zone and the health checks you can as well uh, check the health checks that you want or you can edit it for your own specific recommendations or the configurations that you have and monitoring you can as well keep a CloudWatch alarm and the tags I don't have any tags right now but this is pretty much everything that you need to know so once you go back to the load balancer we will just okay so it's active right now so as we told that load balancer can become one of the single point of contact with the load balancer also we should be able to access the instance isn't it so this is the most important thing you need to remember that every load balancer will have a dns name of its own and once you copy this you can paste and go and you can get the same results see on both of them i'm able to access the same site but didn't we say that we should not be using the public IP of the instance itself and we should make use of the load balancer? How can we do that then? What you need to do is go to the instance. This is the instance that we are talking about, right? Click on this, go to the security group. Okay, then you see the HTTP and SSH here. So we're going to edit this, the inbound traffic. We are going to edit the inbound traffic. So click on edit and the source actually we will change it to be from the security group of the load balancer and once you type sg you can get the details and the list of all the names starting with sg or the security group and basically the one that we had created for our load balancer we'll add that so once we have added this click on save and now go and refresh this you are able to access the application that's well and good but now once you refresh this and here you will no longer be able to access your public IP for the instance because it is going through the load balancer and you don't have any access over HTTP to the instance itself. Isn't it great? So now what has happened is we have redirected all the traffic that is coming for the instance that is the HTTP 80 from our security group that we had for the load balancer. And now even though, even though the public IP is mentioned here, you cannot go ahead and access it. So even if I go and click and copy on this one and I can just go and paste it, it'll not work because all the traffic that I have is redirected from my load balancer. So this will time out, this has timed out. Okay, but this continues to work. This is pretty much fascinating, isn't it? We are now able to secure our application by running it against the load balancer and by using a specific target group that we have. But what we exactly wanted is to make it highly available, isn't it? But we need more instances that can run over multiple availability zones to make it more available. So the next thing that we are going to do is we are going to launch two more instances. So I'm going to click on launch and I'm going to select the AMI that is the Amazon Linux 2 AMI. So we are going to use this configure the instance detail here 
you can mention to and now what we can do is we can add the user data okay that will create our nginx server and now i'm going to add the storage that's pretty much already configured i don't want to add any name tags as of now i can just click configure security groups and i'm going to select the existing one that i have it's basically my security group okay that sits behind the load balancer and review and launch so this is all good i am going to just click on launch and i'm going to choose the existing key pair and click on launch so if you're not aware of how to create an ec2 instance you can go back and check the ec2 tutorial that i have on the previous sessions click on view instances so now you have three instances running just for the naming conventions to be proper and uh, for identification i wanted to give it a name actually so so as we have all the three instances up and running what we can do is we can go and refresh this and we can see that uh, we must be able to see that this should be working isn't it like it should be changing it should be changing all the ip address because it is trying to load balance them but this is not going to happen because we haven't told a uh, load balancer that these two instances have been created newly and you can redirect the traffic you know why because we haven't added them or we haven't registered them as in our target group so this is what we are going to do now so we have our target groups okay we have the first target group so this is the first target group that we have or the target tab that you see here you're going to edit this and we're going to register the second and the third machines as well so we have added this so once you click on save and they have been added so let's see the initial status should change to healthy in a few moments let's wait for that so the status for all the instances that we had have been changed to healthy so let's go to the load balancer again and check the magic see now it is redirecting traffic to all the instances that we had so this is how we are able to balance the load it is quite fascinating isn't it it's just like magic but uh, we are the magicians <laughs> sorry aws is yeah yeah just shut up so that's it that that was pretty much all we wanted to know about how to create the load balancers and how to have the target groups in place and how to increase availability of the instances that we wanted so i hope that was clear and let's move on so let's get into some of the important concepts for the solutions architect examination so um, oh this is good aws elb gives us the new feature of load balancing which is sticky sessions yes sticky sessions with the new sticky session feature it is possible to instruct the load balancer to route repeated requests to the same ec2 instance whenever possible so sticky sessions are a mechanism to route traffic requests from the same client to the same target so application load balancer supports sticky sessions using load balancer generated cookies so if you enable sticky session the same target receives the request and can use the cookie to recover the session context i said a lot of words here to simplify this i want to tell you that cookies are a small piece of information that is stored on your system maybe your computer and the application uses that information to de to detect if you are the same user that has logged in or if it needs to send you a specific type of ad by what you have watched similarly the elb also uses cookies to recover the session so another point to note in stickiness is that it can be defined at target group levels so in classic load balancer as well it supports the ability to stick user sessions to the specific amazon ec2 instances using cookies the traffic will be routed to the same instance as the user continues to access the application so remember that when you apply stickiness all requests go to the same instance every time let's suppose you have four instances and you apply stickiness to the first the traffic always will go to the first instance stickiness is applicable at the elb level and not the application level so it works for both classic and application load balancers but not on the network level as said already stickiness work with cookies and has an expiration date so if the cookie session expires in one day or one minute based on that you'll remove the stickiness as well so let's suppose we question ourselves let um, when we have our load balancer with the application that we had hosted we masked the actual public ip of the instances that we had isn't it Uh, using the uh, load balancer dns and we were able to access the instances using the dns only and if you look at it from the instance side it will only see the load balancer's ip and not the actual ip of the client so then if you had the requirement how can we see the client's ip at our application side so we have our client and when it communicates with the application via the load balancer it doesn't share the actual ip but but what if it wanted to then what it can do is use the x forwarded for http header 
The X forwarded for request header helps you identify the IP addresses of the client when you use the HTTP or HTTPS load balancer. Here, the elastic load balancing stores the IP address of the client in the X forwarded for request header and then passes the header to your server. The syntax would be like X hyphen forwarded hyphen for colon client IP address. That's enough talking. Let's see how it actually works or how it's actually done, isn't it? Let's get some stickiness to the load balancer. So let's enable stickiness now for our load balancer. So if we go to the site again, where we were actually able to access the public uh, DNS for the load balancer, if we repeatedly refresh this page, we were able to redirect the traffic to all the instances that we had. So, but if we want to enable stickiness, we need to go to the target groups, not the load balancers, remember that. So the target groups will have a setting. If you go to the description part, and here you can see attributes, right? There you can see stickiness. This is disabled right now. So click on edit attributes and enable this. So there is a duration that you can specify like uh, that it ranges from one second to seven days. So you can give it anything like I want to give it like for a few seconds. So it will be like uh, 20 seconds. Let, let us keep it as 20 seconds. Okay. And you can see the basic algorithm load balancing algorithm that uses is round robin. We have enabled the stickiness now. The stickiness duration is 20 seconds for us. So it means that it will be sticky for only 20 seconds for a duration of only 20 seconds. So it will stick to a particular instance for only 20 seconds. So click on save. Okay. And we'll just go ahead and refresh it. So first I'll try to fetch the IP. Okay. Now it is not moving to any other instance. It has just stuck to 172.31.34.18 and that is sticky enough because we wanted it to be redirecting traffic to only one instance and stickiness is the feature that is giving us that option. I'm going to keep on refreshing it for your lifetime. So when you see this stickiness duration of 20 seconds, what it exactly means is, is it will be sticky or it will point to a particular IP address or an instance for 20 seconds and based on the round drop in policy, it can as well change the instance to another one. Okay, I hope that was clear enough for the stickiness part. Let's move on. So that was fun, isn't it? Let's check this visually here. So I applied stickiness to the load balancer to direct traffic from login, user, prod to server one. And the same way I did for home and about to the server three. So this was possible with stickiness, isn't it? But there is a problem. What if we have a service with a huge amount of incoming traffic and I redirect or I direct them only to the server two? That would draw a large amount of pressure and load on the server two, making it to break at any point of time. So that's the reason why we should be very careful using the stickiness. So please use it wisely. So what happens here is there are 20% that you have on the server one and the 20% that you have on the server three, but all the other 60% goes to the server two. So this may not be a good way to design the application. So as a solutions architect as well, you need to remember all those things. So let's get some fact check about some topics that are important for the perspective of the exam on load balancers. So we have our application load balancer. It works on layer seven of the OSI reference model. That is the application layer. It supports routing over host name. For example, that you have about.app.com or products.app.com. So it can be used to route over different services in the same instance as well. So it supports routing over path, let's suppose slash users or slash about uh, as the way we discussed previously. It supports URL redirection. Let's suppose you want to direct traffic from HTTP to HTTPS, you can do that as well. It has support for the load balances to authenticate users of your applications. So moving on to the network load balancer, it works on the layer four of the OSI reference model. That is a, a transport layer. Here you get a static IP per availability zone. If you have internet facing or, or what we call public facing load balancer, you should use an elastic IP for whitelisting the IP addresses that you want to be accessible by the app server. It supports cross zone load balancing across multiple availability zone. So what AWS states is when you enable an availability zone for the load balancer, Elastic Load Balancing creates a load balancer node in the availability zone. So by default, each load balancer node distributes traffic across the registered targets in its availability zone only. So if you enable cross zone load balancing, each load balancer node distributes traffic across the registered targets in all enabled availability zones. So for instance, if you enable multiple availability zones for your load balancer and ensure each target group has at least one target in each enabled availability zone, this increases the fault tolerance of your application. That is great, isn't it? 
Coming on to the TLS termination for the network load balancers, you can create a load balancer that uses the SSL TLS protocol for encrypted communication, which is also known as SSL offload. UDP load balancing for network load balancers. So this was a huge request by the developers and architects. With that, you can now use network load balancers to deploy connectionless services for online gaming, IoT, streaming, media transfer, and, net and native UDP applications. So this was about some of the important fact checks that we need to do. So let's move on then. So we all know about the differences between HTTP and HTTPS, where HTTPS is hypertext transfer protocol secure. So how is it secure then? So SSL certificates or SL TLS certificates, also known as secure sockets layer and transport layer security, encrypt information that is sent over the internet and they provide identity assurance for the websites you are visiting. Isn't it assuring that you are visiting a website that's secure? Yes, it is. So the first important point, if you use HTTPS, SSL or TLS for your front end listener, then you must deploy an SSL TLS certificate on your load balancer. You might ask, what is front end then? It is basically the connections that are made from the client to the load balancer. What the load balancer then does is, it uses the certificate to terminate the connection and then decrypt requests from the client before sending them to the instances. The SSL and the TLS protocols use an X509 certificate to authenticate both the client and the backend application. X509 certificate is a digital form of identification issued by a certified uh, certificate authority. Just read about it if you want more information on that. Uh, that actually helps. If you wish to create a certificate, you can create a certificate using AWS Certificate Manager. That's the ACM. When you hear ACM, remember that's called AWS Certificate Manager. That's what AWS recommends as well. Or you can use a tool that supports the SSL and TLS protocols, such as OpenSSL. When you create a certificate for use with your load balancer, you must specify a domain name that you must remember. Uh, you can see in the example here, if we have HTTP request that's basically encrypted information, the load balancer then uses connection termination to decrypt the information before sending it to the instance that you have. That's pretty neat, isn't it? Next, for the HTTP listeners, you need to remember is you can create, upload your own certificates with ACM as we discussed. Second point is you must specify a default certificate. So when you're creating an HTTP listener, you must specify exactly one certificate. This certificate is known as the default certificate. You can replace the default certificate after you create the HTTPS listener. AWS allows or gives you the provision to do that as well. To support multiple domain, add optional list of certificates. So what it means is after you create an HTTPS listener, it has a default certificate as we know and uh, an empty certificate list. So you can optionally add certificates to the certificate list for the listener. Using a certificate list enables the load balancer to support multiple domains on the same port and provide a different certificate for each domain. That's very helpful. So application load balancers support multiple TLS certificates with smart selection using SNI. So with server name or server name indication, you can now host multiple TLS secured applications, each with its own TLS certificate behind a single load balancer. In order to use SNI, in order to use SNI, all you need to do is bind multiple certificates to the same secure listener on your load balancer. ALB will automatically choose the optimal TLS certificate on each client. These new features are provided at no additional cost. This is pretty important as an architect. So please remember these points. It will be really helpful. You can as well read more about these in the blogs provided by AWS. So let's move on. Oh man, we have finally come to the auto scaling groups and this has been a very long session, isn't it? I hope my future self my intelligent future self has decided to load balance it by dividing them into multiple instances or parts for handling better understanding for you guys. Uh, see what I did there? Uh, load balancing, scaling, sessions, no, 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 okay, that was dumb. So, okay, so an auto scaling group contains a collection of Amazon EC2 instances that are treated as a logical grouping for the purposes of automatic scaling and management. If you remember the example that we had in the part one of the load balancer episode, where we hired another car to accommodate the additional amount of people that we wanted to join for the trip. Imagine the people as the incoming traffic for your application and the car being the instance you serve your application at. 
If there is an increase in demand, with auto scaling groups, you can increase the number of instances you want to meet the requirement. So as it's rightly mentioned here as well, when your application load increases or decreases, we use auto scaling groups to make our lives easier by adding or decreasing the resources as per our need. And when you're working on an application or an application that's inside a customer's environment, it's very hard to predict how much amount of traffic you're going to get. We can have diverse situations that can impact the performance of our application. So with the help of auto scaling groups, we can at least try and mitigate this effect. With auto scaling groups, please remember these four things that are really important. First one is scaling out, which means adding more instances or adding more EC2 instances to meet the growing demand. Scaling in, decreasing EC2 instances when you don't need them. When you don't need them, scale them down. That is called scaling in. Desired capacity, allocating the minimum and the maximum number of instances that you intend to spin. So that's the maximum number of instances that you want or the minimum number of instances that you want. Auto assign adding or decreasing the EC2 instances automatically based on the current load. Hope this was clear. Let's dig deep into this then. So what we have here is a simple graph where the Y axis shows the application load or demand and the X axis shows the EC2 instance auto scaling. As you can see here, as the load increases, we have a minimum size of instances which tells auto scaling groups to keep this as the lower limit below which it should not scale the instances down. Here, we have two instances as the lower limit. Then further, when the load increases and reaches the predictive load that we know we will have on a regular basis, we keep the cap at four instances, which is the actual size or the desired capacity. Next comes the big guns. When the load increases further with more traffic coming, we have the maximum cap limit that has set to be six. There are two additional instances that we have in our armory to scale it if we need. So the blue instances are the desired capacity and the gray ones are the instances that the auto scaling group will scale if needed. The reverse happens if the load decreases. This is pretty much a visual way to understand how auto scaling group works. But what we need to understand more is how does it work with the load balances. So let's check that. Just like how we imagine the auto scaling groups can work alongside with load balances as well. And they can be a lifesaver as well, isn't it? So let's see how it actually can. So we have our web traffic coming in and we have a load balancer in place. And the load balancer already knows how to direct the traffic to these four instances. But with the auto scaling groups in place, as you know, auto scaling groups will help us auto scale the instances. So if the load increases and the auto scaling group adds up more instances, these instances will automatically get registered into the auto scaling group and in turn will be managed by the load balancers to redirect traffic effectively. So I'll pause for a minute for you to have a better look into this. So we have four instances managed already by the load balancer and the two additional instances managed by the auto scaling groups. And when the auto scaling group has scaled them up, they automatically get registered into the target groups. And in turn, they are managed by the load balancers as well. So moving on. So what does it take to create the auto scaling groups? So let's see. So auto scaling groups scale instances, right? So what are instances? They are EC2 instances, of course, isn't it? And to create the process starts right there. So first we choose the Amazon machine image. Uh, we have already chosen like before, like the Amazon Linux 2 AMI for the free tier one. Then we choose the instance type that can be like our t2.micro that is for the free tier. Then we choose or configure the details that we have. If you need a bootloader, then add the user data if needed and assign it to the security group, then choose to create or use the SH key. If you need to connect to your instance, do not select proceed without a key pair. You will surely need it for your SH connections. So now we have the instance, let's move to the part where we create the auto scaling configuration. So the first one is the most important one, the fleet composition. So EC2 fleets are a group of on-demand instances and spot instances. That's pretty much it that you need to understand. But there are a few more things that we need to go through. So the EC2 fleet is the one that attempts to launch the number of instances that are required to meet the target capacity that you specify in the fleet request. Okay, so the group size, the maximum size or the minimum size or initial capacity. So we can assign what is the minimum, maximum and the initial desired capacity. So the configuration network details, 
uh, where you can manage the subnets of the availability zone and you can add load balancer properties as our security group sits behind the target groups and thus adding that takes care of it and you add the auto scaling configuration and that's it so all this is fine but there is something that is missing isn't it if you think we have done all the configuration but we haven't told asg on what condition do you need to scale up or scale down dear friend so how will asg know remember we discussed about the custom matrix used by the load balancer health checks to determine the health of the instance we have something called target tracking here by using target tracking we will tell asg if the cpu utilization goes above a certain percentage scale it up or scale it down if we have set target tracking to 50 percent with the target tracking you can keep the cpu utilization of your fleet of the web server at 50 percent from there auto scaling launches or terminates ec2 instances as required to keep the average cpu utilization at 50 percent this is cool isn't it so let's see how you can have your own asg if you are ready let's jump right in